again. Hope everyone is doing well. What we're going to do here is a sort of, well, it's going to be kind of a, a part A, part B video here. I'm going to talk about some other things that we can continue with warm ups that are going to help with, you know, the, the sort of knowledge and conversation with Yang style Tai Chi as we go. And uh, we've already kind of gone over some of the Taiji Qigong, not specifically from Yang style, I know, but it is something that I think can help. Again, if the idea of this channel, not channel, suppose, as much as a playlist, if the idea of this playlist is to sort of start your journey with Yang style Taiji from the very ground and base and bottom up, there are other things that can, I believe that can help be able to make that journey as as uh, uh, sort of profitable and bring bring what you want to fruition a uh, well later later on we'll get into some other uh, stuff with bringing in maybe a little bit of shingy a little bit of bagua in in order to kind of help sort of deconstruct and then reconstruct um, some things that will help with Yang style anyway. I believe that if you're a Tai Chi person, cross training with some Xingyi and Bagua is going to help. And the same in whatever configuration of those three things that you want, they're going to help each other. You know, Tai Chi helps think about the whole body as a coordinated single unit, uh, being able to move from the Dantian, have the silk reeling going on with it, start to begin to understand how to feel and practice with energies in the body, uh, good structure in the body as well, yield and redirect skills. Uh, this is sort of a short list for it too. Xing Yi can really help direct the will, direct the Shen, direct the intent, help start building up some of the skills that are necessary to start working into now fudging that explosive energy. Still also working with intent in terms of how to change that intent, how to make that almost sort of like a laser focus, and then build in some of that positive, healthy yang jing, yang energy. And to be able to, now when you play Tai Chi, help bring that <sighs> Shen kind of in there so it's not just super whatever with it. But then the Tai Chi will help the Xing Yi because sometimes Xingyi, especially for some of us guys, if we're not sort of rooted correctly, and that's you know energetically and emotionally and everything, that can start getting real kind of thing. Xingyi is not a, it's not nice. It's not meant to be Taiji, Bagua, much nicer. Xingyi is not meant to be nice. Xingyi is like you're there now, you're not there. I'm no, you're done. Bagua is really nice to be able to help the body kind of get that nice swimming dragon thing, be able to really up your coordination. It's almost sort of like a master's level class. You get halfway decent with Bagua. It enhances the Xing Yi and the Tai Chi immeasurably. Uh, helps with turning, helps with stepping, helps being able to work around one opponent or be able to think about multiple opponents and everything else like that. And where Xing Yi, was it Bruce Kumar Francis, talks about Xing Yi being my will be done. In other words, this is what I'm going to have happen and you're out of my way. Tai Chi is thy will be done. So we yield and redirect. What, whatever you give me, I yield, redirect, put it back on you. Bagua is a little bit of a mix of the two. Where it is almost sort of like, yeah, they call it like a swimming dragon, especially with Cheng style. And it's, yeah, I'm yielding and redirecting. But there's much more of a trying to find the hollow and thing to exploit as opposed to Tai Chi, which is a little bit more you feel it, you feel it, you feel it, wait for it, wait for it, you feel it, feel it. oh, there it is. So there will be some sort of cross pollinating of, of some things, not just specifically Yang style Tai Chi Chuan, and that's it. Because I think that, as I've said in other things, there needs to be some other influences and, and some other thoughts and some other perspectives on things in order to help enhance the practice. I'm going to be introducing things that have helped enhance my practice. So sort of part A here is I'm going to sort of go uh, quickly over and review the Bada Jin, 
which is the eight sections of brocade. It is a, or eight, eight uh, pieces of silk. It is a Qigong form that is almost ubiquitous in one form or another. Uh, the own that my teacher taught kind of changed a little bit over time as, as some different sort of versions of, of a couple of things got introduced. That being said, there will be um, variances. So if we watch, all right, well, this guy is Shaolin Bada Jing, and this guy is Shaolin Bada Jin. And all eight things have some similarities, but two or three of them are really different between them. And then the one guy who's like Yang style, and the other guy who's Chen style, and the other guy who just looks like he's, or girl, I'm guy is, is the sort of, I'm using it as, as they, them sort of thing. Um, so they're, they're uh, strictly Qigong and like yoga and stuff like that. And all of them look different. All of them are going to look different. Um, you know, each of the eight things will have similarities. But some people are going to do things slightly differently. There's variances in each of the eight. And then the combination that people have of each of the variances creates a lot of, of complexity in a sort of study of Badajin. But it is, it is sort of fairly ubiquitous. It is a really good Qigong uh, set and can help in a lot of ways. And we're talking about Qigong specifically here because even though it's a martial art, there should be some Qigong practice. There, there is, there not should be, there is Qigong in all Tai Chi. Even though it's a martial art, there's Qigong aspect. This is one of the things that helps make it an internal as opposed to external martial art. And being able to help the body relax and sit and focus on the lower Dantian and focus on the intent of the motions and the, the movements and what we're doing uh, will be super helpful with all your Taiji, Shinki, Bagua, whatever you want to do work. We're focusing on Yang style here, so it'll help with the Yang style. Uh, and then the Yang style will help with the Qigong. They, they cross-pollinate and help each other. The other thing we're going to do is more specifically from Chen style Taiji Chuan. It's called the Fang Song Gong. And so it's like sort of like relaxing, rooting, and it kind of specifically really helps target the spine. I have a friend of mine, Jill Fox, who had trained my teacher and his teacher and did all this other stuff and has trained heavily in recent years with the Chen family, like Chen Bing, like major Chen people for several years now. Uh, and she introduced me to it, um, let's say maybe a year or so, maybe a little less than a year. I can't remember the exact timeline, but probably within a year or so of when my back sort of went, nope screw yourself, uh, about six years ago now. Uh, there's apparently, some of this is congenital, and some of this is from all the jobs that I've done, and then martial arts stuff, and some of it is also a big dumb boy behavior. Um, apparently, my on my spine, there's a degenerative disc, uh, arthritis, and spurring. Nice. Uh, at least that's what the diagnosis was six years ago, whether or not any of that is still the case. I don't know. I have no intention of finding out the hard way either. Uh, I found out that that was probably what was triggering my sciatic problems. I had problems on both legs, knee problems on both legs, probably triggered from that. Again, partly congenital. Uh, but this set has been something that I've integrated into my practice uh, regularly and I feel has been really helpful and kind of helping my spine as I've shared it with my students over the past few years as well. They've had a lot of, of benefits and been like, oh wow, actually now it feels really good too. So keeping the spine healthy and aligned and everything else like that, that's totally going to help the young experience as well. So what I'm going to do with this video is I'm going to kind of go over the motions of both the Bada Jin and the Fang Sung Gong. So this will be video whatever number I want to say maybe 9 or maybe 11. It's going to be in that sort of range. <laughs> um, but video number whatever this will be A. You know, B will be the 
Badajin or the Fong Sungung, and then part C will be whichever one I didn't do in part B. However, I'm going to break that down. But this one is just going over it so when we next do the other ones, we can just do it and go over it, and I'll just sort of be guided with it to go. If I get this to work right, work right, sorry, if I get this to work right, then um, I'm kind of experimenting with some stuff here, so hopefully I'll be able to just play and then voice over and lead it that way. I think it would probably be more efficient. You'll be able to see more of, of me as I go with it, and uh, it might be a little clearer as if I can just play the thing as opposed to having to play and talk everything at the same time. So that's the plan as we're going right now. This is mostly a sort of explanation. So I'm going to shift this, so bear with me. Okay, I apparently turned off the dang thing. And I didn't mean to. <laughs> Alright, let's see how this works here with the microphone. So, oh, okay, that should work, but I can't really see my feet very well. And that's swinging to make sure the cat's not sitting there. No, she's cleaning herself. And no eyeballing. Alright, so let's start with the Bada Jin. Again, I'm just going to go over a couple. I'm not going to go over the. Well, I'm going to go over the full eight things, but we're not going to go through the full session now. I'm just going to describe the postures, describe what we're going to do, how we're going to do it, in order to then um, be able to kind of put everything together when we actually go and do the guided version of this. So this is just so you have uh, an awareness of what's to come. So the first one, I'm going to start with my feet, uh, heels together. Toes pointing out 90 degrees. I'm going to bend my knees, and all of this, we're going to practice all of this with the combination of the breathing. So the inhale is when everything sort of gathers and garners in, and the exhale is when it expands out. I'm not going to say open and close or expand and contract, because close and contract to me, when you say that, when you hear it, when you think it, then starts getting into subconscious, and now you have that sort of programmed in. I don't want to program closing. I don't want to co program contraction in with this, because to me, these are sort of anti-internal practices. So I'm going to say gather, perhaps garner, um, bring in sort of thing. Uh, that's usually going to be what you're going to hear me say again, because I don't want to have that other context that is not going to be as sort of correct with what we're trying to do here. So, feet at 90 degree angle, heels in. When we bend our legs, the knees, like always, are going to track out over the feet. So we're not going to have the knees kind of here, whatever. I got one knee on this side of the foot, one knee on this side. Of the, no. Knees and feet line up. I'm going to hopefully not bang this uh, ceiling fan because knowing this house will fall apart and explode. So uh, everything's nice and straight. Linking my fingers together, my palms are right on the crown of my head, not the back of the head, which we might do in other things later. I've seen people do that. I say top of the head, they put it in the back. Top of the head. As we inhale, bend the knees, everything gathers in. Exhale, lift up, push up on the balls of the feet, Turn the palms up, look up, and extend. Badajin, we're actually going to be working with the spine as well. So as we do this, we're expanding, especially the thoracic spine and the beginning part of the lumbar, up and opening the spaces between the vertebrae and spine, or vertebrae and discs, each vertebra and the discs surrounding it, and extending up. Now I'm on the balls of my feet. As we inhale, we come back down, the hands turn in, back to the crown of the head, and gather here. That's the inhale. The exhales push from the feet, lift up from the balls of the feet, look up, and extend. And bring back in. So smoothly, it'll be inhale, exhale.
go in with that. So that's the first one. Um, something came up, but I was doing the thing. I didn't want to interrupt it. Yeah, so a lot of this is going to be helping kind of with the spine too. And the uh, kind of expansion of, you want, uh, as we talked about in the 10 principles, raise the spine. You still want to raise the spine. Uh, so that means expanding, like the crown of the head up and the perineum perineum down, and opening the spine up as we go. Also, uh, I didn't say this before, but it's going to be the Tai Chi breathing. So, you know, the two inches below the navel, inch into the body, the lower Dantian, uh, the second chakra, inhale as we inhale, pulling into the spine, exhale, and push forward. That lower abdominal postnatal breathing is what we're going to be doing uh, for Qigong. So anytime, pretty much anytime we're standing or moving kind of vertical on our feet, we're going to be using that thing. So that'll just be kind of like the general rule of thumb that we're going to do with this. Uh, okay, so the first six are kind of a combination of sort of vertical and horse stance, vertical and horse stance, vertical and horse stance. So for horse stance, you don't need to get crazy with it. You don't need to have like super Shaolin horse stance where your thighs are at a complete parallel to the ground and everything else like that. You don't need to do that. You do need to be wider than shoulder width. Uh, the general rule that I was first taught was shoulder width plus kind of half on each side. What's most important with this, a couple things are actually most important with this. As we bend the knees, the knees expand and round. So you want to have like an arch. If you go look at like a bridge right past like the other thing of a bridge, you see that arch and the way the pylons are into the ground supporting the the weight of the bridge and the weight that goes over the bridge regularly in a smoothly rounded and precise arc is what we want because that arch that arc is what's supporting the weight up even as it moves sways and as weight moves up on it and it's taking that weight distributing it down the pylons and columns down into the ground and out in the way so that way it's, it's supported up. Same thing with our legs. You can either have your feet parallel, like a, like a, just like a straight horse stance, or if it's a little bit easier and you need to, point the feet out to 45 degrees. Uh, and this will be almost like um, if you do sort of Chen style silk reeling. It'll be more like that. We want the knees to track out over the feet either way. We want that nice, secure, good arch not to the side, not kind of leaning. We don't want to lean back, no leaning back and no hinging. So we don't want lean back, hey, what are you doing? We don't want that, but we're also, we're not hinging. This isn't pushing form and swai jiao. This isn't deadlifts or squats. This is internal practice. So internal practice, push those hips in and tuck the tailbone under. Again, the crown of the head, and the perineum or perineum, the, the space between the genitals and the anus, are lined up, vertically lined up. So the shoulders and the hips are lined up too. Bai hui, hui yin, lined up vertically. And we want to sink. We're not squatting so much as we're sinking. So you see how we're not going forward, we're not going backwards, it's not dipping, it's straight, six. So that's what we want for this. Uh, this one, actually, it's going to be a little bit hard since I have the cord here. Um, I don't have any wireless stuff or anything else like that. Uh, so I'm just going to have to deal with this at the moment. So excuse um, how this might look a little bit here or there. Uh, this one, so, sort of think of um, shooting a bow and arrow. So we have one hand that's going to support and the other hand that's going to pull. Now, when we pull, a lot of times you might see stuff like people coming in and shoving their chest out like that. We don't want that. Even though we're coming in, trying to do it this way, this cord is going to be interesting, isn't it? Um, even though we're pulling back, 
what we're doing, this is still relaxed, and more where my focus is, is taking the muscles, like the sort of rhomboid, levator scapular stuff in the back, like right around where the shoulder blades are, and wrapping the spine. So it's almost sort of like part of the massage that we were talking about with like the organs and everything. You're kind of massaging your spine with it as well. We don't really want to pop the chest out or pull the shoulders, the shoulder shoulders back so much and create that tension as we want to use the mind to bring the muscles like the rhomboids, lower traps, levator scapular stuff to wrap around and kind of give a little bit of, you know, massage to the spine. All right, so I'll show kind of front and side views of this as best as I'm able with the cord here. So we get in our heart stance again, sinking. And this is going to be again with the breath. So I'm going to start going to the left, which is this side for me. Um, might be different on the screen for you. But I'm going to bring my left wrist over my right wrist. I'm going to inhale. Sorry about the cord. Inhale. As I inhale, I cross the hands up. I come up to about my chin shoulder height or so. And my left hand is going to hold the bow, and my right hand pulls the string. I look out towards the bow, which is towards my left. As I exhale, I wrap the spine. And again, I'm moving with the breath. So I'm not just going to be, I'm not just, or inhale, 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 and then out or anything. Or... No, it's if we want it even. So the other side is right hand over the left, so right wrist over the left wrist. I'm going to start here at the, you know, Dantian at the cords here. So I got to kind of readjust. Inhale up, right wrist over the left. The right hand hold, oh, I'm not bent, sorry. The right hand holds the bow. Left hand now pulls the string. And my intent is out towards the bow hand. And my intent isn't just holding, breathing. My intent is I'm shooting an arrow at something. So this is where like the mind and some of the meditation practice comes in as well. Because the intent, the E, has to be involved with it too. Not only with the breathing, but with the intent of what you're doing with this. So I'm not just, hmm, hmm. you know, it's not just sort of, you know, stretching the arms or anything. Hmm. 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 No, it's actually shouldn't. You shouldn't be hearing my breath, but I'm emphasizing it for the intense sake. If you hear the breath, then that's supposed to be too much tension. You don't want to hear the breath. Same thing as you're doing Tai Chi stepping. You don't want to hear boom or hit the heel hit the floor. So inhale up, exhale. And is out towards where I'm shooting the arrow and that'll change a lot of the times these will be sort of sets of three or four you can do whatever sets you want but a lot of times you'll see that in sets of three or four some of that might be just the time constraints of a class um, some of it might be kind of the way some things are set as well but again and you don't have to if you want like you know what I'm just gonna play this first one like a hundred times and then I'm going to play Yang style a couple times. That's my practice for today. You can do that. But this is sort of the things in, in the sequence that I was taught. And in the, the way that was the sort of set way that we were doing when I started doing more and more stuff on my own. Uh, so that's two. Number three, uh, hopefully you watched the Taiji Qigong video. You're going to notice this from this. Feet are going to be shoulder width and parallel. Hands up in front of the chest, palms out as we inhale. As we exhale, we're going to separate the floor and the ceiling. So my left hand, as I look up, pushes the ceiling up and away. The right hand is pushing the floor down and away. The right hand, the fingers are facing forward. The left hand, the fingers turn and point out to the right. You can't really see. Pointing out to the right. As I inhale... Again, I gather. Everything gathers, garners in together. And as I exhale, expand. I push the left hand down now, and the right hand pushes up, separating the floor and the ceiling. 
the right fingers point to the left. As you inhale, gather. Again, we want the hands going at the same speed as with the breath, so they cross center in the chest at the same time as your breath goes from inhale to exhale. And again, intent. It's not just I move up, I'm not just kind of stretching and you know, bouncing and dancing or doing squat thrusts or anything else like that. The intent is without activating big muscle, like we're not doing, uh, well, I forget what this is called, you know, isometrics or anything else like that. We're not doing that. The intent, the mind is thinking, I'm pushing the ceiling up and away with me with the left hand. I'm pushing the floor down with the right. And we inhale and gather in and split. The left hand is now pushing the floor down. The right hand is now pushing the ceiling up. That's where intent is going with it. So, yeah, that's kind of what we want to do with those. Next one up, we're going back to horse dance. Like I said, the first few are going to kind of go back and forth. Now, this one, the, the name that I had for this originally was Stare at the Fist Angrily. I shy away from that name for the same reason that I shy away from saying close and contract or constrict because I don't want that emotional content to cause then dis-ease with the energy and the things that we're trying to build up. If you stare at the fist angrily, you're thinking, oh my God, and you're, you maybe you're becoming emotionally sort of involved with this. That breaks the sort of harmony that we're kind of going for internally and starts riling about all the sort of, if your thoughts are going that way, then your emotions are going that way. If your emotions are going that way, that's the behavior. The behavior will then affect the outside world. The outside world's being affected will then affect your thoughts. The cognitive behavioral therapy uh, thought cycle is absolutely correct. So if we get to those thoughts, we're changing what we get from the outside world because we change our behavior, because we've changed our emotions, because we've changed our thoughts. So I don't want to build into this practice, even as we're just doing warm-ups, even as we're doing something that's supposed to be healthy and beneficial to you and me and everybody else. And therefore, as it changes in a beneficial way, our behavior and our thoughts, it'll then kind of reverberate out because our interactions with the outside world will be changed as well. So, you know, the rights kind of end where someone else begins. You don't have to worry about that as much because you're not infringing that much on things because you're helping take care of yourself. And if there are infringements, you're able to deal with it in a much clearer fashion because you're not emotionally disturbed. And I mean disturbed as in not in a sort of clinical sense, um, like there needs to be meds and therapy. Or I mean disturbed as in there's ripples in the water. Um, you know, we kind of want that nice, smooth, clean, clear lake. It's kind of what we're going for. So we're going to go back in our horse stance. Now, when we make fists, let's go over this real quick, too. Uh, we'll go over it later as well, but I want to introduce it here. Curl the first parts. Now, I know I've got these weird paws. They're, they're not proportional to my body uh, in terms of length, and the thickness is probably for someone in a much different body shape than I am, but they're, they're sort of paws. You can see the palms and the fingers kind of are very similar in length, if not the palms bigger and sort of thicker. I have these weird fingers that are kind of all, all over the place and stubby. So best able with this. Everyone's got a little bit of something, something going on. So I'm going to curl in to the pads and then curl under the pads. Now the thumbs. Thumbs. Shoot, what's that from? Transmetropolitan, maybe? Okay. Thumbs wrap the first and second knuckle. There's going to be something we do here in Bada Jing that's going to sort of change that. And that's going to be the only time we ever change that in terms of what we're going to teach in this playlist. If you're like a, a um, like Wing Chun guy and you actually hold fists or something like this uh, or, or something like that, cool. I have never been taught ever anything other than holding a fist to hit like this. My teacher's first teacher, Master Will Duncan, was originally like a Shotokan Karate guy. Then started getting into like uh, Kung Fu stuff from Joe Panaccioni, started getting into the internals from Grandmaster Hu uh, and everything else like that. I've only ever been taught from my teacher, Master Rick Mayer. Uh, and from what I've seen when I've been studying some of the Swai Jiao and San Shao with uh, Sifu John Irvin, 
this is the fist. I've never been taught anything other than this. And part of the reason, too, is because this is where you hit with between the first and second knuckle. When you realign your forearm with aiming for that, the architecture of the forearm and then into the shoulder, and then if everything's correctly aligned throughout the rest of the body, coming out from the shoulder blade or the hip or even the foot is going to be supported in through this, is going to come out through this like you wired and you structured your building correctly but also that um, it's supported going out and supported kind of uh, inside as well uh, to, to help it not do stuff that's going to hurt your wrist. So when we punch, we're going to do vertical punches. Vertical punches means kind of if you were to hold a stick. You have a candle right here. You know what? Even better. Fourth doctor's sonic screwdriver. I'll have to hold a sonic screwdriver this way. I'm holding it vertically. If I hold it this way, I'm holding it horizontally. Same thing with the punch. Vertical, horizontal. Kitty. That is Luna Aria. She's nine this year. Aren't you, baby girl? There she goes. You are a talker. She is a talker. Um, so we're going to do vertical punch, and we're going to come out not straight in front of us. We're actually going to come out on an angle. So the same angle we use for our feet, which would be 90 degrees if we think of both fists. We're going to do one at a time. If we think of both fists, it's going to go to 90 degrees, but we're going to come out at a 45 degree angle from our center. We're not going to actually lift it to shoulder height. We come in from the chamber, which is going to be at the hip, or if you're used to keeping it more up higher, sort of where the forearm is parallel to the ground and the, the fist rests just underneath the pec muscle, that's fine too. You can do either. Um, usually, I'm like, I was taught this mostly with some of like the Toy Gar Gong Fu, but I've been doing this more for the Bada Jin, honestly. We're going to come about maybe pec height or sort of solar plexus, stomach, spleen, liver sort of height. We don't really need to bring it up. It's not just kind of pooping out down from here, but it comes out. And we want to push the fist. Think about pushing the fist, almost like there's like particles or something that you're actually pushing out. And the intent, just like we did with the shooting the arrow, the intent is that push, is that punch, and all your intent is going, bring it to this spot between the first and second knuckle. So I don't want to stare at the fist angrily, stare at the fist intently. So we're gonna get into our horse stance, chamber our fists, inhale, Exhale, I'm going to look to the left corner, and I punch. And I inhale, and with just as much intent, I bring it back to chamber. Turn to the right corner. Exhale. My eyeballs, I'm not dropping my head, but my eyeballs are turned down to look at the fist. And lead follow the fist as we punch to the corner, and as I gather back in, as I inhale, my eyeballs lead follow back into the hips. And I turn, other side, eyeballs look down, not head drop, don't drop the head. Head still up, pulled by a string, chin tucked in. Exhale, push, inhale in, turn, exhale out, inhale back in. Okay, so that is, uh, what would that be, number four, I think. So number five. Uh, now this one, I always say in my class, is sort of best able. This one we kind of want to shoot for, you know, doing the thing. But it's sort of best able because what we're going to do is we're actually going to spend it on the balls of the feet. So it does get a little bit kind of, you know, a little wobbly, kind of a little hard sometimes. Some days I got it, some days I don't. And that's kind of with everything. But, so we're going to go back to the first position we had in the first posture with our heels together, feet at a 90 degree angle. Palms out, and they're going to remain by the hip, by the thighs. So we're not moving our arms with this at all. They're down, and we want to think of like planting the fingers into the ground. Palms are pointing out forward. I'm going to lift up on the balls of the feet. We're going to be stretching our neck, but also our eyeballs. 
So as I go, I'm going to lead, I'm going to look over my left shoulder, leading with my eyeballs. I'm going to try and stretch my neck to where I can look with my eyeballs directly 180 behind me. And then I switch to the other side. Look over my right shoulder, leading with the eyeballs. So I actually turn, the, it's not just I'm looking forward and I turn my head, I'm still relatively, rel, 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 relativistically looking forward. I am actually turning my eyes, getting my eyes to work out too. And I'm going to the other side. And that's that one. Um, so yeah, help stretch the neck, help stretch the eyes. Okay, so this next one, I'm going to show you two versions of it. I'm going to show you the version that I do more normally, and then the version that I do as a um, sort of modified version for some of my classes if, um, uh, for like beginner stuff, if people are a little bit more elderly, if some of the, the flexibility and stuff isn't there. I kind of have two, I kind of have two classes to a certain extent going, even though I technically have four, it's still kind of two classes. And the, the sort of intent of both are, are very different. Um, so I'm going to show you both. First one, first variation. I learned both from my teacher. The, the second one is, I think, the one we did first, and then we changed it to this other one. And uh, it's another horse stance one, the final horse stance one in the sequence. But I really want to stress, be careful of the knees. Try and make sure they don't buckle in. Try and make sure they don't go too far out to the outside of the foot either. We want to try and keep them as, not try to keep them, we want to work to keep them as correct in alignment with our feet as we possibly can. This is definitely one where the idea of leaving the ego out is probably going to be of a better mindset for it. So just like you don't want an ego lift where you have, you know, too much weight on something and you can't lift it appropriately. So you're all, you're kind of cheating, your body's making adjustments and, you know, you're, what is it, like the bicep curl and you got a whole body do this. Now there are cheat ways to do some of these things and do them appropriately. And that's usually bringing like the eccentric down. The, the concentric motion might have a little cheat up, but really focusing on, on being correct with the eccentric movement we don't really want to do any of that with this we want the body to be correct so if you can't get the twist because it's a big twist if you can't get the twist to the point where then the knees aren't doing one of these or something with it either choke up a little bit on the on the horse stance or don't twist as much you might have to do both but again, this is something we don't want to ego lift with because it's eventually the, just like ego lifting. It's even if you get away with it now or tomorrow or something, eventually that's going to catch up. And even if that means that you just don't have the result that you want to have, that's bad enough as far as I'm concerned, let alone now bringing in some sort of other health or injury problem, which definitely don't want either. I don't want it for me. I don't want it for you putting out good, healthy, groovy, juju, mojo for everybody. And I'm not bringing this in for a hug. I don't, you know, no offense. I, I'm, I'm more, even under normal times, not pandemic times, I'm more sort of like the finish where six feet is still too close. Ten feet's good. You know, my whole boundary thing, if absolutely necessary, is if I can reach you with my foot, you're too close to me. So I'm not a touchy sort of guy. Anyway. Um... So, yeah, we want to go into our horse stance. Fix my britches. First variation. I'm going to lift my palms up to the sides. Now, as you can see, it's slightly forward, not directly to the sides. I've been playing with this more lately, and directly to the sides does kind of activate, especially that mid deltoid. Bringing this forward helps relax the deltoids and keeps that same thing we talked about of collapse the chest as we raise the back. So it helps me keep that whole body as one unified sort of thing. So bringing the hands out here, I, I've done less of, 
in favor of bringing this more in. Now, as we, if we get into Bagua with the mother palm from Cheng style, we're going to have this. This is one of the, you know, if Big Rock spreads its rings or a Twin Dragon holds a pearl. This is also going to be sort of a, a transition mode we're going to do in a couple of the postures with Taiji. So the idea of not here, if I say shoulder height or wrist, shoulder, shoulder, wrist, as we'll get into later and you'll see, that doesn't necessarily mean in an absolute uh, horizontal line like this. Bring the arms a little forward. So, I'm going to come up. Inhale. As I exhale, I'm twisting over my left side. My left hand is coming down. My right hand is reaching up and over. And I want to look over and see my right heel. I'm turning to the left. I want to see my right heel. I'm making it sort of look like my left hand is next to my right heel. And my right hand, as it pushes over, stretching out latissimus dorsi, serratus, and you have the internal and external oblique, obliques over here too. You might be even hitting a little bit of the transverse abdominis as it goes around, because we're twisting with it as well. Now watch. See my knees? I'm not bending in. I'm not coming too far out. I'm trying to keep that arch as best as I can. So the inhale, we come back up to center. Exhale, I'm twisting right and looking at the left heel. And we come back in. It's like inhale, exhale, and inhale, and exhale. Now, we come back in. The modified version of this is the same twisting and same looking, but what I'm doing is I'm keeping my hands engaged on my hips. So it's going to look like this. And I'm still trying to feel, still working to feel the knees and the feet in line so my weight going through my heels into the ground. Quads are still engaged. Quads are going to be engaged. You can't get away from engaging your muscles. We're still human beings. We're still going to use our muscles. The idea is we're going to use them as efficiently as possible. And that is going to be done by keeping the body held in the correct uh, sort of structural, with the structural integrity of the skeletal architecture sort of thing. That's what we want. Okay, last two. Um, so this one is going to be, uh, again, best able. All mine are going to be best able. It doesn't have to be super crazy. This is more sort of a rolling jackknife. So as we come down, we almost want our, our spine to kind of think of like a, a chain going around like a gear. Uh, the image I always have is around the roller coasters because I really like Cedar Point. I like roller coasters and I like Hollow Weekends. And haunted houses and all that sort of stuff like that. A um, little bit like Grissom from CSI, where it's sort of, you know, it's like a, you know, in a, in a sort of safe, controlled way, but still you can allow yourself to kind of experience certain anxieties or fears or anything and kind of get that out. Yes, I, I use Cedar Point uh, roller coasters and haunted houses for my own sort of philosophical and uh, uh, ideas and work. And, and spiritual training, and meditative training as well. It's funny, you used to see, as a side note, you would see like the pictures when I would go frequently with like the ex and our friends. Everyone else is like, my one buddy's like, oh, like, oh, like kind of terrified, he's screaming, my ex and, and uh, our other friend, they're like, yeah, hands up and screaming. And I kind of have, And we're like, dude, do you even like roller coasters? Are you bored? I'm like, no, I, I'm at really genuinely enjoying this. And there are some stuff, you know, my buddy's yelling and, and screaming stuff and everything. And I'm playing around with that back. Or on the Gemini, you know, you reach over and high five. Not anymore. But you reach at the time, you reach over and high five and stuff. I would do all that sort of stuff. And sometimes I keep my hands up. Except there's one part in the, going back to the Gemini where I, the illusion of it just makes me think my hands are going to cut off. And I, know, I, I pull it and that, that freaks me out. But... It's still training, and haunted houses, roller coasters is still kind of training to me. 
Uh, but either way, that's the thing that I get with the spine. That was all over the place. So we want to, and again, this is a way to, and think about this because the Fang Sung Gun is going to do this a lot. This is a way to then start opening those spaces between each vertebra and disc. The way to open those spaces, and then as we roll back up, it's a way for us to help realign now the spine. Some of that space has been in there. Some of that space is going to stay in there a little bit. It's going to alleviate some of the compression and pressure that we have uh, from just standing, let alone walking, or if some people are running, especially on cement, macadam, all this other stuff like that, that makes a lot of compression and brings everything down. We want to open that up. It's one of the benefits of doing sensory deprivation floats too. Your floating kind of helps the body go back to uh, expanding a little bit. So we're going to have it where our hands are going to be behind our back. And as we roll down, they're going to stay behind the legs. Uh, unless you get all the way down and you can bring them down to the toes. Even, but even though when we come back up, we're going to bring them back behind the legs and we're going to roll back up. Uh, and then at the, when we come back to very vertical, we are going to kind of lean back and reset going forward uh, and go best able. And what we want to do, the head, neck, the shoulders, the arms, the traps, all this, just don't even, the, the, the intent where, you know, we're talking about like the intent of pulling the bow. I mean, the intent is to let that go, let that relax, let all the tension bleed out. So that way that spine can open up and you get that sort of mobility coming down and coming back up. So what it's going to look like from the front is this. First I tuck the chin and I'm going to go in, in pieces. And you can really feel each of the vertebrae and the disc between it as you go. I don't know if my headset. down, keep going down to the toes, and come back up, and again, head, neck, arms, chest, and kind of nice and relaxed, kind of stacking the spine, realigning it vertically. It doesn't have to be this sort of torturously slow, it can be a little bit faster depending upon your breath and your need. And I'm going to come back up. My hands are back on the lumbar area, small of the back. And leaning back. From the side, it's going to look like this. See if this helps. Tuck the chin. Roll down. Mortars and releasing. Traps in the head. I'm going to come down, get uncaught from my shirt. My shoulders and traps. You can hear my, my voice sound different because my mouth is relaxed. And then come back up. Stacking the spine. And then it's just rolling back. Sending the hips. Coming up the thoracic spine. Resetting the cervical vertebrae and the head up. Again, pulled up from the straight. Chin tucked in. Reset back. Very good. Okay, last one. Now remember earlier when we said there is one thing that is a variation that I've learned. Again, that caveat of the fist pier. This is the one thing. And I think pretty much universally the one thing you shouldn't do with a fist is fold it into the palm. This is a Qigong routine. It's not a Chuan or a Zong. Bagua Zong means palm to know it's a martial arts method, a boxing method. Tai Chi Chuan, Xing Chuan. Chuan meaning fist, boxing method, martial art. This is just Xing, this is just Qigong, I'm sorry, Qigong. This is meant for health, meditation, Spiritual development, energy work, qigong, energy work. So, we're going to wrap the thumb in that fist. Place the knuckles right on the kidneys. Kind of kidneys, adrenals. Now, I know 
that. I, I, well, I know one, one kidney is technically a little higher than the other. I want to say the left is a little bit higher than the right, so technically it should probably more look like this. But keep them kind of even. I like to keep them even. If you want it to start at this, you can kind of give the area a little bit of a massage. A bit of a massage here, a little bit just taking care of the area, bring a little bit of the energy there into the kidneys and the adrenal glands. Kidneys, by the way, according to traditional Chinese medicine and Taoists, are the seat of the essence. So very important. Now, there again, there are two ways to do this. Um, I pretty much do the first way I'm going to show you. I don't really recommend the second way unless you know how to play Fa Jing correctly. Because otherwise, you're going to start kind of... All the stuff you did with the one before, with building the spine back out and opening that space, you're going to kind of lose... You're going to kind of send shock waves in the body that you don't really want to send. Uh, and it might, you know, start hitting and pinging like a sonar or something in with the knees or the back. And the shock into the body is going to be kind of counter to what you want. Um, this is why every time I see someone in the gym and they're doing deadlifts and they do the deadlifts where they come in and bang, get down. And they kind of relax and then tense back up to do this. And they come back and bang on the thing. And it, it, it. It does this to me because all I can sort of see in their body is like this shock wave, this hydrostatic shock going into their body, into their knees, into their hips, into the lower back, kind of reverberating around in there. It's just like, stop doing that. Hold on to the damn bar. You don't need to hit the ground every time. Why are you releasing? Because now you release and it's like extra strain back up instead of the time. Ugh. Anyway, clearly I have a very specific um, preference into how I deadlift. But um, with this, so um, we keep the sort of adjusted fists in against the kidneys. What we're going to do is we're just going to kind of bounce on the heels. It's very nice to start getting rid of some anxiety. It's very nice to start getting rid of some um, like blockages. You know, if you've got like stagnant water, you kind of shake it up a little bit. Yeah, you can kind of shake it up a little bit and get that through. I tend to go with this sort of sort of pseudo magical number of 36. Uh, the Yijin Jing has something that uses something with 36 little taps. Um, nine is a hugely important number numerologically with Taoism stuff. So it's four uh, and all that. 36 is uh, a very important number as it is in this sort of 108 sequence. Uh, which is also part of the 72 sequence. So if you, you know, if you're used to um, a lot of things from from Eastern thought, uh, 108 comes up a lot. There's 108 beads on a mala, for example. 72 uh, is a number that shows up in some level all over the world. Uh, you know, Graham Hancock will probably have a more extensive and um, comprehensive list uh, than kind of I will with it. But 72 is a hugely important number kind of all over the world. And remember, a lot of this stuff comes out of things like monasteries and spiritual uh, and or sort of religious co connotations and all that stuff. I don't care what religion, I don't care what spiritual practice, from the Tao Te Ching, the Bible, and everything else has symbol in it. The numbers and the things that go on are symbolic. Does that mean 36 or 72 or 108? Because, uh, you know, if 72 is the magic number, half of that is 36. You add 36 to 72 is 108. Um, even the pyramids are on, the, the, the great pyramids, uh, the Giza pyramids are on, a, 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 you know, a 72 number line. Anyway, um, does that mean that those are specifically super, really, really good for the body? Well, yeah, anything that you're going to do with that positively is good for the body. Um, but with those numbers, yeah, it might be, especially if you program that in with your subconscious. But it's also tying into a symbolist sort of nature that kind of goes all over the world. Um, so that's kind of where that comes from with that. Now, the other version, same thing with the fists on here. And what it is, is you bring up on the balls of the feet. And I got 
people living underneath so it's gonna be kind of hard to do it. And you send through the heels. <laughs> now I don't say just stomp down on the heels. You actually have to send through the heels. And by sending, that's the fudging energy, down and out through the heels correctly with everything in line and with the breathing and the intent correctly, that sends all that out that you're trying to get rid of out of the feet and out and around. This is part of something that will help train with Fa Jing. Again, I don't recommend that unless you already have some practice with this anyway. You're pretty good with your alignments. You're pretty good, and maybe as we're actively doing some like maybe punching or elbow work, Fa Jing, maybe some kicks, you're already kind of getting some of that work anyway, been doing this for a while. I don't really recommend doing this until that. Just I'm not saying anything about you, I'm not saying about any other teachers or my teaching or any of this other stuff like that. Just basically, again, I'm trying to make sure that people are as healthy and everything is correct and everything is, is sort of safe and appropriate as possible. Doing it in this removed way without having people in class that I can, you know, adjust uh, postures, be able to get into the real minutia, be able to have conversations, interact. You know, I don't, it's not like the one school that I teach at and on Saturday mornings that have, you know, the big, you know, punching dummies and kick pads and people who got other martial arts training and stuff like that and st stabs and spears and swords and all this cool stuff. I don't have any of that. It's just my dumb butt, I said something else, um, mostly in my apartment. I don't even have wireless right now, so I'm kind of doing the best I can. So I'm going to put this sort of caveat on this. If you want to try the everything gathered and bah, send through sort of fudging training, get some other practice in first. Again, not denigrating you at all, just saying I just, I want to sort of, you know, dot my T's and cross my I's. And make sure everything is cross my eyes and make sure that everything is sort of safe and effective and we're building correctly and safely for everyone and this done correctly will start helping build up what you need to for the buh, or the dodging correctly all right so that's the bada jing this is going on a super long time um so that's bada jing fang sung dong from chen style uh let me Give me one moment here. I'm trying to get this all done just in one thing, bang it out, get it out there, and be done. I really hope, I really, really pray that the microphone did not pick up the sound of me actually drinking. I forgot to put it up to the thing. If it did and you heard me actually drinking or any of a swallow or anything, I am dreadfully, dreadfully sorry. I know how freaking awful that is. It's the worst. It gets into your wits. Claw your head off. Sorry, a little misophonic. So Fang Song Gong coming in from Chen style. And we want to work the spine. Uh, so the sort of first and last things of it in a more sort of official sense, I'll go over. But honestly, I don't really do too much when I'm doing this in my classes. This is almost sort of like one of like the warm ups and stretching things that we'll do. And so the kind of first and last things I don't do a lot of because I also do them in different ways throughout the, the larger training sequence. So there's a couple of things that go in. One is, again, we're, we're thinking about the spine. Now it's Chen style, so we're going to start with the feet together. I'm not a fan of this. Uh, but head up, chin in, of course, proper posture. And we're going to bring the weight onto the right leg, step out with the left shoulder width, bend the knees slightly, and hold. Now remember, we're not hinging, and we're not leaning. We're sinking. Song, fong, song, go. Sinking. So we sink. Another thing we can work on as we do this as well, as we can think about bringing in the Zong Zong in with this as well. And 
Now, what we're going to do as I go over this um, uh, with the guided one later, is I'm going to basically time it with three breaths. That is when I've counted out, when I've seen with the Chen stuff, it works pretty well in terms of the timing with class and everything as well. So we're going to use three breaths. So if you're standing, three breaths, three breaths. All right, so that's the beginning part. It's going to be kind of hard for me to do some of these with the headset mic, so just kind of bear with me a little bit. Still shoulder width. First one we're going to do is basically a big circle with the torso. The head, neck, arm, shoulders want to stay nice and relaxed. And there's going to be big circles we come around. And it's not just sort of like here. It's the whole sort of body is going to be worked with it. Now, a couple of things. One, after I do one side three times, I always come back to center for a breath or so before going back to the other way. Part of that is for the students. Part of that is for me. I admit there are some things that I do with warm-ups and some of the training that's for Sifu. Um, because if I kind of just kind of keep going too much, I start, I get like, I basically get motion sick. There is one of the, there is the Chansu Gong Chansu Bing, uh, Jing, the silk reeling exercises. One sort of Chen Zhao Wang sort of set. The other one is by Feng Ziqiang, I believe his name is. And that one is a little bit more sort of silk reeling plus Qigong and as is a little bit, I don't want to say necessarily more expansive, but Chen Zhao Wang's is a little bit more stripped down out of Lao Zha, Chen style. This other one has kind of other stuff in it too. And in it, there's actually, you know, one version or another of something similar to this. And it's bringing hands up, and I got the cord, and coming down, and these big circles like this, kind of having the Feng Sung going in with it as well. And with the hands out, and I swear to God, that thing has always messed me up. I, it always messed me up. When my teacher taught that up teen years ago, to this day, that thing messes me up. I, I don't know, if, sometimes it's just dizzy, sometimes I actually get like, actually um, motion sick from it. Um, it might even trigger a little migraine stuff or something like that. Um, but a lot of the things with the, the Chan Su Gong or Chan Su Jing, you do like six, eight, 10, 12 times or something. I do that more than three or four and I don't take a pause between going from one side to the other. I don't feel good. So, you know, listen to your body, listen to what it's telling you, feel all that stuff. And I'm, I'm going to build that sort of pause in there to help with me. And if, if you don't need it, you can just go right into the other thing. That's fine. I need that little pause there. So I'm going to kind of roll. There's like a half roll forward and then roll head, neck, arms, shoulders, chest, nice and relaxed. You're kind of moving that dantian, and the body is sort of flopping around with it. Now, again, watch the knees. The knees aren't doing one of these things or anything with it. Knees and feet, steady. I'm moving from here up. So as I roll, I still have those bridge support columns with the legs, and the body is rolling. So I'm only going to go two, and then sometimes I might hold here, Sometimes I might come right back up to vertical and then have to kind of bend back in and roll the other way. And I'm going to go two the other way here. I know I said three, but I'm, again, I'm trying. I'm already going super long with this, so I'm going to bring this down a little bit. And I'm going two just to kind of balance myself out. And then I come down and I hold, straighten the legs, and straighten the spine. I like to go right in to the next one, and that's lifting the hands in front of the body. And I look up, I turn the palms up, and I'm acting like I'm pushing my fingers through the ceiling. I don't know why I went into David Lynch there, but I did. And yeah, like my hands are going through the ceiling. Now again, like we talked about before, opening the spine vertically. As I'm reaching up, it's almost my, my, my thoracic and low and upper part of my lumbar is extending up. Well, my lower part of my lumbar, my sacral spine, 
coming down. So I'm going to open and extend. And again, I'm going for three breaths. After three breaths, I straighten my head. I make fists, regular fists with the thumbs out. And just like we did with the Bada Jin, I'm going to wrap my scapular muscles, the rhomboids, lower, tri, um, my triceps, traps, beta scapular, all that around the spine. So I am, it almost looks like I'm chest thrusting, but I'm not really chest thrusting, building that tension across the chest and in the deltoids. What I'm doing is I'm wrapping the spine, the muscles around the spine. Hearts of the fist, the heart of the fist is where the thumb is. The heart of the fist is point, pointing out. Three breaths. And then from there, I open, bring my hands in front of my body, push forward, and then jackknife bend. So I'm making a big L. And same thing, I'm pushing. So the spine opens one way and the other way. And then I'll release, bend the knee, and roll up like we did before. And again, I like going from one to the other, so I'll go right into the next one, where I lift the wrists and the elbows come down, so it's like tidy opening form. I'm going to flip my left palm over, my right hand curves. Now look at my wrist. My wrist is above the elbow. We're going to get into this later on. This helps keep the shoulder down. That elbow starts lifting, the shoulder comes up, and what we've done is now we've taken the arm out of the hole. So that's down. When I come up and I flip and I come up, I'm just rotating my wrist and forearm. I'm not pushing with my elbow. Again, we're going to bend the knees, keep the knees over the feet. And I'm twisting to the left. As I twist to the left, my goal is to point my hand directly behind me. I bring my head back, I hold three breaths. After three breaths, I reset my head, and I come back to center. That's part one, part 1A, we'll say. Part 1B is we're going to roll the shoulders and the arms. We're going to roll them. And the image I have in my head is like, think of like a flag in the wind. But it also helps train the idea of moving through the arm chain, and then eventually the body chain, in a smooth order. So I'm going to roll first my shoulder, so the posterior deltoid, and I turn to the mid deltoid, and come in down the triceps, the elbow, roll down the forearm, the wrist, the hand, the fingers, and then when the fingers come out, drop. So I'm not, you don't touch with the other hand, the other hand stays down. So as I roll the right side, so we do to one side, we do to the other, my other arm stays down, but I'm still rolling from the shoulder to tricep, elbow, forearm, wrist, hand, fingers, drop. And we do that three times each side. So it's going to look more like this. And then you repeat on the other side. So we bring up the wrists, right hand, palm up. Left hand curves, twist, keep the knees steady, point behind you, head back, three breaths. We come back carefully. It's not just, we just don't snap back. It's nice and smooth, back. And then roll the right, out, down. Roll the left, out, down. Three times each side. Uh, one, two, three. So uh, the first, this is the first of the sort of, sort of tuck chin and uh, extend. This one is just going to be more of the jackknife sort of bend, like we did in the Bada Jin. We're going to link the fingers back behind the head. When we tuck the chin, just a gentle, gentle pressure for you Mystery Science Theater 3000 fans out there. Gentle pressure. And we're not like cranking on the head or anything. We're just putting a little bit of, a little bit of something on there to help open up the cervical vertebrae, that's the vertebrae in the, in the neck, help extend that. And we're going to roll down and bend. So the head kind of reaches out towards between the teeth. Three breaths. 
So we're getting an extended, instead of down and up, down and up, down and up, we're getting that extended stretch with the spot. All right, next what we're gonna do is really, we really wanna help stretch out, again, the serratus, obliques, um, latissimus dorsi, and maybe even a little bit of that um, transverse abdominis that comes around. So I'm gonna dip to the left. Dip up to the right, no, that's, uh, palm forward, plant those fingers into the ground. The other hand is going to extend up and plant those fingers into the ceiling. Palm up as well. Three breaths. After three breaths, you take the upper hand, in this case the right, and you let it strum forward. So that it's, think of like Peter Townsend playing guitar. Um, I'm going to move my cord here. Don't worry about the other hand. And the hand just... <laughs> like the string was cut. Your whole, it's being held up by a string, string was cut. And it strums down like your, or wild stallions, you know, be excellent to each other. Kind of that, but we're still in this position. So this releases, and we still hold that bend here, and then slowly straighten. And then and again, so three breaths, release, three breaths, straighten. I kind of like to hold here for another breath as well to get equilibrium back. I haven't had a problem with it, but I just, I, it's just something I, I do for me. I think the, where I've learned it from did the same thing. Um, but I'm just describing what you're going to see when I do it and how I teach it. And I'm going to dip to the right and same thing, just mirror side. So the right hand fingers down, palm forward, left hand fingers up, palm forward. After three breaths, I got the cord here, but, you know, release. And the arm kind of does one of these. Three more breaths. Come back here. Now this is... It's really sort of the penultimate posture, but it's usually the one that I close with is, is kind of like a finale one anyway, too. Kind of brings in a couple of them together. Now what we do here is, again, we bring up the hands like we did on that earlier one. Look up, put the fingers through the ceiling, but lift up on the balls of the feet. Now this one is definitely gonna be one of those that is best able. Don't hurt yourself with it. Do the best you can. Again, I'm going to bring the hands back behind the head, tuck the chin, gentle pressure, and now I roll down to a squat. And when I get to the, the pinnacle or apex, or I guess it's still mid-19, though I'm low, I set the heels. I'm in full squat, and my weight is mostly on the heels, and my knees are still tracking out over the feet. I'm not necessarily pressing open my knees. Um, but I'm extending my spine. It's super good for the lower back, too. And I guess squatting like this, um, I'm not trying to be silly, I'm not trying to call anyone out or anything either, but squatting like this is also really helpful for, to avoid or heal stuff like hemorrhoid cramps, too. But super good for the lower back. When my lower back went, this is one of the first things I want to make sure I could redo, as well as, like, uh, exhausting. Uh, after our breaths here, release the hands forward. And again, maybe another breath or two here and there to, to get the feeling. Push up from the feet. So push up from the heels, straight legs, but I'm still that I usually have to kind of cheat open a little bit to help with the front squat. I like to give uh, another breath or so here in the center. What we're going to do is turn the hips. And once the cord is to the eyes, and lower the, the left leg. Three breaths. Roll over to the outside of the right leg. Now again, watch. My knees aren't buckling in. I'm trying to keep them, again, my flippers are flipping side to side. When we come back to center, I like to give another breath or so here. Release the hands. Bend the knees. Man, I hope this thing is still plugged in right. It is twitchy about it. Okay, basically, that's basically the set I do. There is one uh, more in it. And what that is, is draw the right leg to 45 degrees, bring the weight onto that, and lift the left knee 
guarding the groin. Deep breaths. Switch, 45. Bring out the knee. Three breaths. Come down. And since we started, stepping out, we'll end stepping in. Okay, so that is a not at all brief overview <laughs> of the um, Bada Jin and Fong Song Gong uh, that we're going to do as individual routines uh, with that. But this way, when we play the routines on the other part of the playlist, uh, it's just play along as opposed to me having to kind of describe and go over and do a lot of what I did um, while we're trying to actually practice it. So it's we're just going to go right into the practice into the other videos for it. Okay. Um, again, it's a long one. Sorry. And I hope it's helpful. And uh, we'll get on with the, the Bada Jin and Fong Song Gong here. I'm probably going to do Fong Song Gong first and then Bada Jin, now that I think of it, because that's usually kind of how I run some of the classes and everything else like that. Use the Fong Song Gong to kind of get the body relaxed, get things to open, especially the spine, uh, get things moving a little bit. And then the Bada Jin can then have uh, the extra benefit of, of some of that stuff open and some of the blood and the energy flowing through and everything else like that. So it, it the, the Qi Gong, the energy work part of it can uh, work better for all intents and purposes. So, uh, yeah, I hope that's helpful, and I will plug this in the easier time of this, and thank you. <laughs>